something that I'm always curious about because I'm a big fan of doing cardiovascular work. Um, are you do you advocate that doing let's say an hour of cardiovascular work a day? Does it does that keep the weight off or does that tear down? No, it does not it? necessarily keep the weight off. Uh, weight control is primarily a matter of calorie balancing. You could you could do two hours a day of aerobics, and if you're eating too many calories, still be getting fat. Um, Another point here that's important is that your weight training can give you the cardiovascular benefit at the same time that it gives you the muscle training benefit. If you're not resting too long between sets and you're sustaining what's called the uh, age-adjusted pulse rate, uh, you will develop a cardiovascular training effect and improve your heart and lungs along with your skeletal muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. well, give us a sample diet of someone that wanted to lose weight. Uh, well, I mean, how many calories? I guess it really depends on the individual on the person. Individual. You can't make an overall uh, no. um, call on that. But, but there, uh, there is, a, there is a, a fundamental principle involved here, and that is as long as the individual goes below his or her maintenance level of calories, they will lose fat. Mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether their maintenance level is 1,500 calories a day or 15,000, any number below that will cause the body to revert to fat burning instead of storing fat. Is alcohol as fattening as everyone says it is? Uh, well, alcohol contains seven calories a gram. Carbohydrates and protein contain four calories a gram, while fat contains nine calories a gram, so it's in between. Uh, no more beer, Bill? <laughs> I guess, guess that's so. what he's us. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I, I truly believe that you can indulge in those things on occasion without any harmful effects, as long as you're taking care of yourself, training two or three times a week, and basically following a well-balanced diet. There's always room for a few calories of beer. Okay. A <laughs> few, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Under your theory, I guess, of, of training, would that apply to men and women? Yeah, the basic physiological principles involved in uh, exercise physiology are apply to everybody, male and female. But it, it is true that men gain weight in areas that, that, that women don't gain weight. Is, well, is you know, I used to think that, too, and I think there is a little bit of... Uh, unobjective sexism there. I've seen a lot of women training now in the gym who gain even faster than some guys. Again, with, even with the women, it's individual genetic potential that determines how fast they'll grow. Some guys have almost no genetic potential for growth. Uh, same is true for females, but then again, there's some females who exhibit a tremendous potential for growth. It, well, it's kind of hard to know, though, if, if you do have genetic, I mean, you could, I guess you, you should get a signal if you've been training for 10 years, you don't yeah. see any growth. It's you just something you that. can only accurately assess in retrospect. You, you won't know until you try. Right. So right. for those who are interested, try it. Don't uh, be put off by someone telling you, well, you don't have the potential. That's something no one knows, again, unless you're look, looking back over a period of time. Within two or three years, if you haven't gained anything at all, either you're training improperly, which is often the case, or you have poor genetics. But then again, anybody can improve. You may not become a, a muscular marvel, but you can improve your muscular tone and lose fat. Mm -hmm. And it also enhance a certain degree of confidence with that also. For sure. Let me ask you one last question about steroids and we'll move from that subject. In reference to women, do you feel it's as prevalent in the women's side as it is in the men's side of competition? Yeah, for sure. Again, among those who are competing, it's omniprevalent. They all take it. And Without a doubt. Can you mask it, as we've, we've heard in the media? Well, it's interesting. Over the past two years, the International Federation of Bodybuilders, along with the National Physique Committee, have been testing competitors. But it's obvious to those who are in the know, who have the eye for these things, that they're still taking it. So they have somehow found a way to mask the test results. So it almost sounds like you're saying there's a certain look that uh, derives from a person from taking these drugs. Without a doubt, for sure. Can you give us some examples of what that might look like. Well, the muscle tends to have a more swelled, even at times bloated look, and the, the veins actually become almost grossly enlarged. One of the uh, side effects of steroids is that it increases blood volume by up to two pints. So when you see a bodybuilder in a gym with what appears to be abnormally huge veins, they are in fact abnormally large. Hmm. You know, Seeing some bodybuilders make it in, in the acting fields, um, example Arnold Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. and Lou Ferrigno, do you think there's room for more bodybuilders to, to make it like Schwarzenegger? What, what do those guys have that others obviously haven't been able to show? What, is it just well, not, well you, your question sort of presumes the notion that every bodybuilder wants to be a movie star. That's true, that's true. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, 
two things Louis and Arnold had going were their enormous success in bodybuilding, which tended to carry over to the public at large, and they were extremely disciplined and highly motivated people, and I think what they did was reappropriate their energy and discipline to the area of acting, and as a result, they became successful there also. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's obviously a, a desire on their part to to, to get have become into, actors to get into the movies. You're absolutely right on that. And I know you've done some commentating work for the networks um, in bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Is there any of that in your future? And is bodybuilding going to be uh, get more television exposure? I don't think bodybuilding will get any more television exposure. And as a result, I'm not really interested in pursuing commentary as a career. Mm -hmm. How, why wouldn't it get more exposure? It just didn't get the ratings or. Uh, that's a good question. Over the last, actually up to about six or seven years ago, it seemed to be getting increasing exposure. The last two or three years, however, the networks haven't carried nearly as many contests. Mm -hmm. ESPN is. ESPN has taken over. Right. 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 Let me ask you also, is there a best age to start training man, male or female? Well, I'm, I don't think there's ever been any definitive studies done to uh, say anything conclusive about that, but some people speculate that from 25 to 35 seem to be the best years. Okay, but that's, that's the best years. Again, anyone can improve, even up to the age of 70, 80. As long as you're reasonably healthy, you can get to the gym, you're suffering from no uh, physical ailments, anybody can improve. I've got to ask you, Mike, about one body part in particular that I'm sure a lot of men out there watching will be interested in, too, is the stomach. Right. Now, how do you get a washboard stomach like we saw on that? I'm sure most guys with summer coming up would die for that kind yeah. of information. Well, you definitely don't want to indulge in too much beer like we were talking about before. Right. Uh, but it's primarily a matter of nutritional control, calorie control. As long as you know what your maintenance level of calories is and you go any number below that, you will lose body fat. Of course, the, the further you go into a calorie deficit, the more fat you'll lose at a faster rate. Uh, and the secondary factors, of course, physical training, building up the muscle tissue. But even if you are training and building the muscle tissue up and you have the fat, you're still going to appear fat. Right. Now, talking about the fat, are foods like, let's say, mayonnaise and the cakes, are, are those the type of foods that will cover up the muscle? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's a see how common misconception. Again, it's all calorie control. It, even if, if you were eating below your required or maintenance level of calories every day, let's say you're eating 500 calories below your maintenance level, you could eat that. All those calories could, could be comprised literally of table sugar and mayonnaise, and you still lose fat. There is no really one single food or group of foods that could be called fattening. It's your overall calorie intake that determines how fat you'll be. So I can still go on late night uh, Pop-Tart rampages, is that what you're saying? As long as they're under control. <laughs> it's nice to know. <laughs> Let me ask you, I know over the last, I think it's about six or seven years in a row now, Lee Haney is, has won Mr. Olympia or Mr. Universe right. seven years in a row. In your mind, and I know you hear that there's, there is some kind of politics involved, can anybody beat him first off? Well, I think there are a number of people who can beat him. Um, actually, what it boils, to down, boils down to is who's going to be in shape that day. Very often, even the top competitors miss their peak by a little bit. It's true in baseball, true in football. If he misses his peak by 1%, the guy who was second place last year can sneak ahead of him. So Lee Haney is definitely beatable, without a doubt. Could you give us a couple of names of who you think would be, say, two or three gentlemen who would have a good shot at it? Uh, well, there's one guy who stands on the horizon at the moment who I think is going to win next year, and that's Sean Ray. Uh, last year he placed, I think it was fifth or sixth, not really in the top running, but that was only his second Olympia, and along with that he has all the physical requirements and super abundance for winning the Olympia. Besides that, Lee Haney's won seven in a row, and people are getting a little sick of seeing him in there. Is he maybe living on his reputation alone now more? Uh, yeah, there is that element. Because bodybuilding is a little bit subjective uh, and is subject to political influence, uh, I think so, yeah. I know that, uh, like we said, that you've written a couple books now. Is, is authoring any more books in the picture for you in the future, or are you pretty much content doing what you're doing with the training? No, I'm very content training the people that I'm training. Uh, if I was offered a deal, I would do it, but I've done three in the past, and the money isn't all that great, and it's like having a homework lesson every night, which I never did like. Uh -huh. uh, so I don't think so. In terms of the discipline, you mean the discipline and to, uh, the research, and to, it's a very competitive industry, isn't it? The the material. That, well, um, along with that, I think the the bodybuilding uh, book market has been saturated. 
Mm -hmm. There, if you go to most bookstores now, you'll see at least two or three dozen bodybuilding books. I don't think there's really room for one more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there is, maybe I'll do one. <laughs> In our final minute now, Bill, you got any more questions? Um, sure. Mike, do you see yourself coming back again and training again? Absolutely. Just kidding. Not. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what about one of the, one of the just a quick thing here? One of the theories you hear about people when you turn fifty or sixty, yeah, everything falls to your knees, which I know is not true. But could you share yeah. something about that with a couple of examples? Yeah, uh, I think that's one of those misconceptions that's motivated in part by fear and jealousy and the lack of understanding about what bodybuilding really is. Right now, there are at least two or three competitors on the top professional scene who, believe it or not, are in their 60s and winning. Huh. About uh, six weeks ago, a man named Albert Beckles, at the age of 61, won the Niagara Falls Grand Prix Bodybuilding Professional Contest, huh. beating out guys who were in their 20s. That's He's been competing for 35 years, so where's, where's his muscles turning the fat? They are not. He's getting better at the age of 61. That's not good. 51, 61. That's good to know. That's and good. I, I would bet he'll be doing it at the age of 70. Well, Mike, uh, we're getting the signal that we've got to wrap up. I want to thank you. Obviously, I was filled with a lot of misconceptions, thank you very much. misconceptions about training, and you've enlightened me. Thank and you, Anthony. It's been very, uh, it's been very interesting. My pleasure.